thank the organizers for for including me in this. I'm humbled to speak after Anne, a scholar that I've long admired and uh, whose work is really terrific. I wanted to talk today about the seesaw movement of capital. Um, my bigger project has to do with uh, urban redevelopment in South Korean cities and trying to look at how uh, anti-eviction movements and affordable housing rights movements intersect with uh, uneven development forces and this insurgent citizenship idea and whether we could expand citizenship in the 21st century to include renters. Uh, I mean, of course, we think that renters are citizens, but if you look at the way it works on the ground repeatedly, uh, decade after decade in many different content continents, actually, it seems that tenants are still left out of the equation. So just as an, an aside, uh, most of my work is on housing redevelopment. But I was speaking a few days ago before I got on the airplane, right before I got on the airplane, about the, on a panel that we had about the Great Kanto earthquake and massacre of 1923 in Japan. And it was a, a big event with a documentary film from the 80s. And it struck me listening to some of this morning's presentations and our discussion of empire and revolution that Neil Smith's work is, is still so provocative and relevant and deserves to be revisited in all kinds of uh, contexts beyond which we know it. And I think that he would have appreciated the complexity of that earthquake massacre situation, which was that uh, officially 6,000 Koreans were massacred uh, in the, the weeks and months after this earthquake in Japan in 1923. And it, I think it's relevant today, and geographers think so, because we have this current discourse going on about natural disaster, climate change, and ties to political insecurity, and uh, conflict, and civil unrest. And it also reminded me a great deal of the um, issues in the US with migrant workers dying, because these Koreans that were in Japan, and the Korean numbers they say now are, the, the Korean newspapers say it was 25,000 people massacred. And actually Chinese were also massacred because they also flunked the pronunciation test of the officials to try to determine who was actually Japanese and who wasn't. And so uh, hundreds of Chinese were also massacred in this case. But this earthquake massacre was covered up. And what made me think of Neil and his complex understanding of empire and geography was that the Korean workers that were killed were migrant, mostly day laborers. And my colleague Ken Kawashima has written about this very fantastically in a history of uh, colonial period Korean workers in Japan. And it's not something that you usually think of, but it has all kinds of parallels for current day situations with immigration and, and workers' rights. Uh, but the odd thing that came out in, in, it was yesterday, it was two days ago's discussion, was that it was actually the US military government had a hand in covering this up, and that Japanese researchers and, and Korean Japanese researchers and even ordinary people like school teachers have been excavating this history for decades. And in the late 40s, writers would write stories about it. And the US military government covered it up because they said that the US relations with the Japanese government were too bad at that moment to, for them to want this to come out and be discussed. So even attempts of the people who were involved with this, it was kind of a combination of mob massacre with police and government and army uh, involvement and then covered up by the government. Uh, actually was more complex than that. And it had to do with Japanese empire and US empire meeting. Uh, so I, I thought that that just reminds me of some of Neil's 
work on Bowman and, and geography and empire and how, how complicated things are and how working class historical geographies are always being erased. And that's the tie-in to what I wanted to talk about today. So this, this uh, cartoon is a common picture from housing rights movement from the 1990s in South Korea. And it's the, the workers are on the bottom falling off the hillsides where the cheap housing used to be. And on the top you have the, the riot police, the army, the, the government, and the uh, bourgeoisie. And the slogan on the bottom says, well, now where are we going to go? And so this is an example of an old neighborhood that disappeared in the mid-90s, and it's very hard to find these kind of uh, neighborhoods of small, old, self-built houses that have been improved. Uh, this was the Tenants Association Women's Group that became the cultural troupe because um, they found it hard to identify as working class feminists. Feminists were something that uh, middle class and upper class women did. So they changed themselves to the traditional cultural group and learned how to uh, do traditional drumming. Uh, and then their neighborhood was transformed. So that, that brings me to my rereading of Neil's work and on uneven development in some detail over the past year. And you know, I welcome suggestions about if I've gotten something wrong. But I, it really jumped out at me that this seesaw movement of capital is quite, quite a useful concept and deserves to be uh, applied a little bit more diligently, perhaps, than it has been. Um, so in, in a place like Seoul, which had its Velvet Revolution in the late 1980s and had its, its democratic moment, its revolutionary moment, things are now coming down much more to, well, what do you do to build citizen capacity? And what does it mean to be a democracy after, uh, after having had dictatorships for, for decades? And it's not a, an easy question. So I, when I reread this seesaw, the uneven development argument of Neil Smith, the seesaw movement of capital idea jumped out at me. And, and Smith wrote that, uh, well, uneven development is the concrete manifestation of the production of space under capitalism. And then, in terms of the mechanism, there was this geographical seesaw that explains that no sooner do areas become fixed up, improved, made less dilapidated, etc., that the capital in motion shifts to a new target. And so there's a great deal of discussion, not only in South Korea, but also in, in the U.S., about uh, how to how to get this movement to come to your area if you're a speculator or how to keep it from coming. But there's a tendency not to look at the bigger spatial picture where I think Neil got it right, that it, it moves, the seesaw moves the capital around and it moves around between different countries now, between cities, like the global city competition, world city competition for, for uh, corporate capital. And then between cities within a country, and then within cities uh, themselves, between neighborhoods. And so if people and players operating in the city react as if they're just concerned about a particular area, then the, they're not benefiting from this idea of the seesaw moving the capital around. Well, I'll, so I'll, anyway, I'll, I'll skip some of this because we're all very tired and very hungry. <laughs> but what I did is I made a table uh, because the moving around is getting quite spectacular for somebody who follows urban renewal sites. Just 
tenaciously over decades uh, in a place like Seoul, or you could do it anywhere, but it's, it's easier to do in Asia because things get built very quickly, and then they also disappear quickly. Um, but what I found was in the past couple decades since I started doing this, that it used to be that blue collar neighborhoods uh, were becoming expensive condominium areas. Uh, but now, in the 2000s, so the 21st century, it's middle class neighborhoods that are becoming expensive elite neighborhoods. So I guess most of the working class neighborhoods have been dismantled or, or dispersed to the edges. So uh, the concentrated working class neighborhoods are gone and people are, are struggling very hard to find affordable housing as they are, I guess, in many, many of our global cities. And then there's a lot of money spent for new recreation and leisure sites like parks and uh, these rebuilt fake rivers and things like this, uh, which are successful, but they, they're successful for the public and creating public green space and um, cooling the city, et cetera. But they also serve as an anchor for further expensive real estate development, pushing people out. So if you look at this seesaw, uh, a number of different sites that I followed, I decided that I would make a table, and I would see it's a big, it's not finished, but it's a big table, and I have to think more categories to put on it. But I was trying to figure out, uh, because there are now some interesting experiments to try to maybe counter the seesaw movement of capital, if we could see what kinds of things the tenant associations or anti-urban renewal groups, uh, what kind of agendas they pursued and whether it resulted in countering the seesaw movement at all or whether it just was a musical chairs game. Uh, so that that's trying to figure out, I mean, I think it has a policy implication perhaps that if you could understand, and I think actually the more I think about it, I think Neil would actually really not be very happy with this. He'd probably tell me that it's misguided as an effort. But there is a, a radical planning tradition of trying to, to think about spatiality as a whole and do things that don't make things worse across the board for working class families and neighborhoods, and that's pretty much, I think, what has happened. So I started out by looking at the, the, the one that I showed you already at the beginning. And in that neighborhood, Moadong, 1996 to 2001, uh, it was led by housing rights movement activists and the tenants association. The solution that was negotiated was that tenants would stay in the neighborhood during the redevelopment and after. So most of the people in that photo of the drum troop are still there. They still live there. They had some negotiated when to put social housing units in with the upper middle class condominiums. And then what was the result for the seesaw movement of capital? And I could say that uh, yes, the seesaw went up and the what used to be a mixed income neighborhood, evenly divided between classes, became a majority upper middle class area. Um, but it still has a remaining working class minority because of that tenants group movement. Um, this one here is 2008 to the present. Uh, the leadership was the Tenants Association. This was a Christmas Day mass in Wangshini Newtown, which is an enormous area. It's one of the last huge working class areas of Seoul. It's been turned into a big construction pit for luxury housing, not middle class, but luxury housing. Um, they negotiated to be sent out of the neighborhood for social housing while the building's going on, and then they can return to new social housing units after the redevelopment. And the number of people <laughs> diminishes as the years go by. And the effect on the seesaw movement is that there's a symbolic incorporation of the remaining working class tenants into what will be a new luxury area eventually. Um, but the area will not be a working class area. And 
a lot of the, like the media called it a Pyrrhic victory. So it's more symbolic than anything else. But this is one of the, the mottos that's on all of the real estate brochures that sell the condominiums that have yet to be built. There's another one. Um, and I, I go to the real estate offices every year when I visit, and it seems like every year the price of the condominiums almost doubles. So they started off at $200,000 or something, and then they went to four, and then they went to six, and now they're eight, now they're heading towards a million. And it was, it was even stranger, I was at a, a conference on giving a paper on the role of religious groups in these urban renewal fights. And right across the street in Kangnam, the fancy part of Seoul, was a model housing building that was selling these condominiums. So they're trying to get Kangnam to move to Wangshini, this new working class, this formerly working class area. Uh, and it'll take a few more years to see what happens with that. Uh, another case that happened in, this was 2011, it was a, the Poedong example, there was actually, it was, the crisis erupted over a fire that was set by children, but it was a, a shack kind of community that made its living through recycling waste cooperatives, businesses, and uh, the government used the fire, this is also in Kangnam, a very expensive most expensive district of Seoul. And so the government was using the fires that burned down some of the houses as an excuse to get, uh, get the land back. And uh, so they, their leadership is, has been the Residents Association. And they've uh, mostly negotiated to relocate in return for giving up this valuable land. And so the seesaw movement of capital succeeds again in that case. Um, and it's not clear what the future of their business collecting, recycling would be. It's mostly elderly people. Okay, this, this is an area that has had tenants associations that's still strong, and it's still strong even in the social housing, and it's made up of repeated evictees from numerous Difference. Like, there are people my age who've been evicted four times in their lifetime because they always went to the next cheaper neighborhood and then the seesaw movement of capital went there and so they moved again. And they've gotten quite good about doing cooperative businesses. Uh, so what happened with that neighborhood recently, this is Kumodong. So they fought their, their big fight in 1994 to 2000 and uh, became apartment buildings. Uh, but the tenants remained. They were a feisty group, and, and they uh, started these cooperative businesses and have continued to grow them and, and evolve them into different things that are profitable. Uh, but the interesting thing is that now, in, in, back in 2010, 11, it, this area became under redevelopment again. So the cycle was uh, just a little over 10 years in this case, as far as the intensification. I mean, the rent gap theory is really working here. Uh, and so this is the first sign, this was before the <coughs> tragedy in Yongsan where uh, there was violence and six people died. Uh, this is a middle class neighborhood that uh, became a ghost town by 2011. And it, it wasn't even a hill of squatter shacks or anything like that. It was a solid middle class neighborhood from the 80s that uh, got taken down in uh, to put up more of this kind of, this is some of the condos across the street from it. And it's that name of that development is the I Want Condos. That's a popular brand in South Korea. So the apartments are quite popular with middle class and above. So the this particular tenants association has stayed active in their social housing, which is right there mixed in. Uh, and interesting, they run a credit union that has a big clientele and a, a bunch of businesses related to, to dry cleaning. And interestingly enough, their 
food co-op, which was one of their earlier cooperative businesses, has now become a unifying force between the, the gentrifiers and the tenants. It's run by the former Tenants Association, but uh, organic food is really big with middle class communities. So oddly enough, the, the Tenants Association food co-op is a sort of becoming an accepted, successful part of the neighborhood. Uh, so they, that neighborhood does retain some uh, middle class <coughs> areas. So uh, the, the two that I was interested in following, and it's too early to have any good pictures. There haven't been any good protests or anything yet. But there's two areas that have been written about quite a lot. One is called Sansei Village, and it's a, a cooperative business. I close this? Uh, Sansei Village is a cooperative business experiment to build a village community uh, project. And they've done a lot of, it, this is headed by housing movement activists and community cooperative, uh, like human ecology cooperative movement people. And it's in progress since 2011. And some of the people here probably know more about this than I do. Uh, but it's, they're on my list now. And they've, they've done extensive work trying to figure out how can they get environment, living environments to be improved that are dilapidated and shabby or uh, you know, problematic to live in without resorting to tabula rasa urban renewal. And so they've looked at doing improvement, gradual improvement plans in a sort of en masse way and setting up these cooperative businesses. And the barrier they seem to be running into is that a number of the residents are against the experiment because some percentage of the, the residents, and I'm not sure how many, and I'm not sure that they want to, to they don't want to give up on the experiment, so I'm not sure that they're going to publicize this. But uh, there are peop a lot of people who are invested in the seesaw movement of capital for their own gain, and so they have some opposition from uh, people who live there now. Uh, both of these experiments are somewhat on the edges, northern edges of Seoul, very, like, as far away from Gangnam as you can get and still be in Seoul on the old half of the city. And the, the other site that I uh, started to look at and analyze their text is this, it's called 104 Village, Hexa Village, and the innovative city planners have seized upon this as a place on the fringe where perhaps uh, they could attempt to limit displacement of working class residents and keep the form of the original neighborhood and keep the alleys and the low, low buildings uh, and still renovate and rebuild. And so they're asking a lot of critical questions now about themselves, about will it just become a shadow of a former, like a, a, a beautified, former moon village, which is what the, the slums are called because they, they used to be up on the hillsides nearest to the moon. And uh, the problem that this, this Peksa village is running into is that 80% of the homeowners have already left. So they still own the houses, but they're not living there in anticipation <coughs> of this coming urban renewal. So they're facing the urban renewal encroaching from all sides around it. And uh, they have a, a really strong plan to try to keep the original form. But I guess they see that some of the historically preserved low-rise districts of Seoul have become extremely expensive kind of Soho places because of, um, because of not having tall buildings with a lot of a lot of people crammed in. So uh, so it's it's they could they're worried that they could potentially be making a very expensive neighborhood out of trying to save a working class community. Uh, so so that's that's it that's my attempt to operationalize the seesaw movement of capital idea for looking geographically at the whole city and for a way that the planners can use to try to keep this infinite displacement of working class communities from happening. Because one thing that they've always been clear about uh, during my years of ethnography there is that, that 
they don't want to follow the example of U.S. cities, and they don't want to just push the people at the bottom down so far that they're just considered write-offs, disposable, disposable labor force. They, they, they want the working class people who make up these tenant associations want to be included in the dream of their democracy and their nation, and that involve is entails keeping some kind of control over this seesaw movement so that people's lives don't become just infinitely more impossible and difficult. So I appreciate your thoughts and inputs. Thank you. I really appreciate your pointing out how uh, ridiculous at times the critique of Neil's rank gap theory were, in part because at the end of that 1979 article, he says quite clearly the presence of a rank gap does not guarantee that there will be gentrification. The absence of a rank gap guarantees there will not be gentrification. And so he's really quite clear about this. But the thing that struck me rereading a lot of his gentrification work recently was that what he was really developing, this is true of his uneven development work, I mean, they're, they're closely related too, is what he was really developing was a theory of the circulation of capital. And it's very much about the circulation of capital and how capital circulates through cityscape and, and the built environment. And, and that's the piece that I think got lost in a lot of the debates. And I think it got lost in a lot of Neil's work as well uh, as he was debating um, David Lay and so forth. And then the other um, thing that, that, uh, that was curious in, in your presentation is when you did the quick outline of when rent debates have come up, uh, one crucial one that I don't think you mentioned was the 1920s, when um, rent becomes central to the Chicago School theorizing of the city. And uh, Neil's pointing directly to that, in particular in the work of Homer Hoyt, and, uh, and who he draws directly on to talk about what the rent gap is, although he tries to rework it in this circulation. So I, I think there's a lot there that we need to recover that's as much about the circulation of capital as it is about um, gentrification as such. And I guess that comes to this question of the seesaw motion of um, capital, and it's where the question that I have for you, Lisa, and that is, um, one of the, the arguments that I think Neil makes, or that I know he makes when he's talking about that, is that uh, he argues that um, investment in one area necessarily entails disinvestment in another area. So where, where are the, that's the seesaw, right? Where are the processes of disinvestment, the active disinvestment within um, the Seoul cityscape going on or elsewhere in the country? Because there's nothing that says that capital being invested in Seoul has to be, you know, the, the de-invested, the investment correlate doesn't have to be there. It could be, it could be in Ho Chi Minh City. It could be in all kinds of places, right? And so where's the disinvestment that's the flip side of, of the investment that you're talking about? Do you want to take a group of questions or do you want to respond to both ways? Okay, we have three more questions. So we have Eva and Stephanie. Mine's more of a comment than a question, um, and it's to to applaud the, both of you for for your work because um, in sitting here I was thinking that I wrote my master's thesis uh, on uh, the seesaw of capital as it applies to to uh, livestock raising in Kenya um, a, a long time ago um, at, at UCLA, um, and it just strikes me that. Geography, maybe more than other disciplines, seems to um, go year by year by the latest hip and cool trend. And um, given my name, some of you will appreciate that, that the, the, the Wayne's world 
movies, there was a, a skit with, with Garth being Wayne's best friend, and this being my first thing, um, where he's, he asks Garth to, to, to come up with the word of the day. And a long time ago, when I was in graduate school, this became the game that I played at the Annual Association of American Geographers to come up with the, the word of the day. Um, because it just seems like geographers go on and on with the word of the day. And, and if you catch on to the word, the next day, you're too late, and, and nobody's talking about a gamba anymore. So that, that was 2006. Um, but when ideas are good, they stay around. And there's a reason why uneven development has a third edition. And I think you know we're seeing that. Um, that doesn't happen very much in geography, by the way. I don't think uh, social justice in the city has gone through three. Just two. So. It tells us something. That's just all I was going to say. I want to thank both of you for really interesting presentations. And I have uh, one question for each of you. Um, uh, first of all, the, the last presentation, you started to talk about citizenship. And, uh, uh, but you, I don't know if you really came back to uh, give us any conclusions about um, what you, uh, I mean, could you perhaps develop that a little bit? It would be interesting to know, for example, did uh, the protest, the act of protest by itself, mobilization and so on, for the, uh, from the tenants' uh, point of view, did it change them, for example? Did, did it change them uh, as they saw, how they saw themselves as citizens and so on? Uh, perhaps a form of active citizenship, something like that. I'm not sure. Um, it would be interesting to know more about that. And then I wonder if possibly you could uh, uh, explain a little bit more about the the property state and the property mind, because I was thinking desperately that this is isn't this everywhere? <laughs> isn't this just uh, I don't know. Uh, Capitalism, or um, I'm not sure, but um, I was thinking about uh, the people in Hanoi, how they think about property, and so people in Stockholm, uh, and so on. So, if you could just explain a little bit more how you thought about this, thank you. Uh, just one, one quick thing to add. You, you ended in Singapore. And I just wanted to hear where the MCAP was. There. You didn't take that part of the story back up, so maybe you could finish that. Um, and, and yes, I was going to ask a similar question. There is also, of course, Engels' housing question, right? Where the bourgeoisie moves the problem around, which is part of that story, of course, but the lesson of it is relatively clear, is that you cannot solve these issues without Articulating housing land questions to to dynamics of population, but but also the other inequalities that are produced in the capitalist context. Um, I wonder if you could say that exactly as well. Well, I, I think most of the comments were just comments in my favor. They were by Eva and uh, Stefan. So uh, first, what, what what I meant by property state was that if, if I compare, for example, the public revenue of uh, Helsinki and Hong Kong, so Helsinki gets, uh, or in Finnish cities, gets less than 5% of the public revenue from land. Hong Kong gets between 20 to 40. And so the whole economy, so if, if you look at whether income and what kind of company? So if you look at the, the listed companies on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, most of them are doing real estate as a side business. But that's not the case if I look at the Finnish Stock Exchange. They, they are different kind of companies. So I'm, I'm arguing that much of the revenue and income is, is coming through property. And it's, it's definitely not, I'm, I'm sure also Sweden is not the case. And so what, what I meant by property mind is this, that um, people are, are willing to sacrifice their, their home and sentimental values. For example, in, in 
in uh, appropriation in Singapore and also this in block legislation, the law compensates market value but no sentimental value. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in this kind of uh, institutions and rules that uh, make people orient more to the market value of their home. And uh, so uh, I think in, in Sweden also the home in the <laughs> by the lake is this kind of image that uh, Swedish people would like to have. So it's it's not that the, the property value. So that basically I I mean so and, and well this is an interesting question, rent rent cap in Singapore, but uh, because um, and I, I forgot to mention why I was talking about Singapore with this David Lay's uh, uh, explanation of uh, of uh, cultural property because there are certain similarities between Singapore and Hong Kong and one is the scarcity of land. Of course this scarcity of land is a different issue in Hong Kong because you have a lot of land in new territories but in Singapore really the limit is Indonesia and Malaysia so there is a necessity to redevelop the land and so and if, again if I, if I think the age of buildings in Europe in Finland, they are kind of medium age. They could be oldest building in Helsinki from the beginning of the 18th century. But that's a tremendous long in Hong Kong and Singapore. So even so, this end block legislation, if the building is less than 10 years old, it could be demolished if 90% of the residents would like to have it demolished. So 10 years old building, what's, what's that? So. Again, this rent cap is, is not this kind of a uh, gap between the, but, but this necessity to redevelop. And I think this land market mechanism is completely different. And again, uh, similarities between Hong Kong and Singapore is this high rise. So I think Hong Kong people think Singapore is a low rise, but for me, 40 stories is a really high rise. In Helsinki, the maximum limit is 66 stories. <laughs> And then we, we have one twenty story skyscraper in Helsinki. But it, it, again, you, you talk about the difference. So this uh, redevelopment, the recycling of the, the buildings, I think the rent cap is definitely there. But again, I, it's not so much in terms of location. <coughs> And, and uh, the conditions change, but and, and again, I think gentrification must be a completely different issue in Singapore and Hong Kong because uh, uh, location is, is uh, less different in, in at least in Singapore than, than in uh, Los Angeles or so, other cities. I think I didn't have any other. Yeah, I'll try to be brief, but I'm very hungry. I'm not very tired, so my memory is not particularly sharp. Um, in answer to the question about where the disinvestment is occurring in response to the seesaw going up in many areas, the older part of, of Seoul. Uh, so I started making a list, but I, I think it's uh, it operates at different scales, shall we say? <laughs> so we could probably go through all five foci of urban consciousness and put it, put it and add one for the world. Uh, so this investment that is related to the investment there is occurring in the U.S. Rust Belt in Manchester and uh, Birmingham, those kind of places. Also in I think the rural countryside of South Korea is having a rough time for decades as Seoul has burgeoned. Also, even if you look at the neighborhood just to the east of one of these experimental sites that I mentioned, the, the 104 village, uh, it was a huge new development at the end of the 1980s, right after the Olympics. And it's now the place where my friend, the Bohemian starving writers live because the, it's starting to fall, fall apart. Basically something that was new in 1990 is now decrepit um, and up for redevelopment again. Uh, so it's where the North Korean defectors are clustered. <coughs> and so even just within Seoul, you see things 
moving around. And I guess that since since the employment picture doesn't really ever seem to do anything but increase the percentage of low-paying jobs, we'll always uh, have a need for working class housing. So the working class didn't go away, it's just their neighborhoods keep getting eradicated and then they have to find some other crap to live in or you know, some other version, the newer versions of chats. So that's my answer to that question. The comment about the word of the day in geographers, I totally agree. And I actually reread Uneven Development after we lost Neil, just as a way of dealing with my, my grief and my shock. And you know, I, I taught it all winter to, with the graduate students. And uh, actually, there was only one geography graduate student in that seminar. They were all from like art, design, urban planning. The geography graduate students weren't interested in, in Neil Smith's 1984 book, but I actually found it to be full of insights that and the seesaw theory to me has not been exhausted in its applicability. <coughs> the question about citizenship, yeah, I didn't get to that, and I also spared you about five pages of details about the seesaw theory in specific. Um, but where, where I'm going with the citizenship uh, is trying to pick up this idea of insurgent citizenship that James Holston wrote about with Brasilia and in, uh, in Brazil. And to try to think where that idea works or how it could be expanded to work further. And the, the critique that I, I had of the way he was using it with his uh, communities was that still the basic fulcrum seemed to be house ownership. And that's also true in the South Korean case of where the, the, the cleavages, the factions broke out in the housing rights movement was that, uh, you know, originally a lot of the land in Seoul was public land from the dynasty days. And so people, when urbanization uh, took off again in the 60s and 1970s for, you know, probably been happening for hundreds of years in different ways, but that phase of it, when that occurred, people just crowded to the city and built wherever they could because that's where the, the factory jobs were. Um, <clears throat> so uh, even then, the house owners ended up with a better deal out of the urban renewals and that, than the tenants. And that advance of policymakers to figure out how to, to split that opposition up into two groups was done even without the land being owned, but just on the basis of whether you owned a house or you rented a house. And that was one of the big accomplishments of housing policy right in the years leading up to the Olympic Games, from 1982, three on. It's big innovation. I think it's being copied now all over Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, that, and there's, there's even a document from the first case that I showed you about that, um, that I have a book that I'm Coming, coming out with bits on, on that. Uh, they actually, that group, tenants group, received a letter from City Hall saying that the tenants group people were not citizens because they didn't own land. And that sounds really weird, but as, if you think about it, Koreans use German law by way of Japan, the Japanese occupation. So by German law, wasn't that originally also the way it worked, way, way, way back? Uh, you know, and even in, I think, <coughs> the classical well, days, Greek and Rome also, right? Property ownership was the one of the defining that, and uh, males, those were the people that were citizens initially. Uh, so it's not such an old idea. And I even, I was reading a, a graduate student colleague book, uh, on Jason Frank wrote a, a book on constituent, it's called Constituent Moments, about the U.S. in the revolutionary period. And he's talking about how citizenship was not, uh, participation by civic groups was not assumed to be part of citizenship, that that had to be fought for. Um, and we forget that. I, I think in the U.S. we never think of that. We assume that non-governmental groups are as uh, 
legitimate participants as elected officers, but he actually uncovers those moments where groups had to fight the founders of the, the United States for the right to participate. So I'm trying to take this, this idea of insurgent citizenship and see if it can be expanded to explicitly address the situation with tenants worldwide. And then the last about the housing question, I think I have a manuscript on that somewhere that, that, that's, that's in a closet. And that's what's interesting about these, these experiments that I've started to, to look at because they are trying to combine the social housing, public housing solution with the private house owners uh, repairing their buildings so that they don't leak and so the wind doesn't go through them. And there's never been a good solution found, and urban renewal is so efficient in Asia, and it's quick and it's cheap to build things, right? It's cheaper to build a lot of times than to fix old buildings, even in the West. So uh, these, these ecological cooperative groups and the innovative planners are trying to fuse the two together, and it's developing, uh, the, the 104 Village has like a 600 page book out. Because the city's gotten into the practice of producing documentation books for neighborhoods that are zoned to be erased. Like rather than producing them as tools to save the neighborhood, they're being produced as historic documents. And they're really quite fantastic. They have extensive interviews, oral histories, um, planning documents and everything. And, but one of the, the crevices that's coming out is again between homeowners and tenants, not surprisingly. The tenants are in favor of public housing coming in to, to that area. The homeowners are against it, not for the reasons that I assumed when I started looking at this. I assumed the homeowners, homeowners want expensive condominiums for speculation. But in fact, the homeowners are un mostly unemployed elderly people who are making their living from the tenants and they don't want the social housing coming in because they'll lose their <laughs> livelihood and they they also don't want to gentrify because they were poor themselves and they don't want to put out make the tenants not able to stay there so it, it's a new kind of owner tenant crevice that's forming that, that threatens actually threatens the whole project uh, but these kinds of things keep getting reinvented in new ways, and I think it's fascinating to try to tie it back to more fundamental concepts like rent gap and uh, seesaw movement. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for further questions. I've just seen a fine print over here on the back page that says that all property owners are denied of dinner. <laughs> According to the Hong Kong principal geography. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um,